Hi friends, welcome to this uh, conversation that's part of our transformational leadership program. Uh, I'm Bill Gettler, I lead the program, and we are so glad to welcome Sharon D'Amelio as our guest this evening. We've had a great afternoon in the transformational class, transformational leadership class. We began with a, a really uh, important and significant conversation this afternoon, and we'll continue it all day tomorrow in the class. Sharon was a reluctant recruit to the world of nonprofit fundraising. She did her undergraduate work at Williams College and then came to Yale Divinity School with thoughts of pursuing a PhD in ancient and biblical languages. YDS uh, worked its magic on her though and she narrowly escaped a career in academia and switched her focus to ministry and the nonprofit world. Sharon got her first taste of effective fundraising during her time at YDS when she interned with Allison Cunningham at Columbus House, where Allison was then the executive director. Um, and Sharon's been working in that development world ever since. After graduating with her Master of Divinity, Sharon served as the director of development at the Central Outreach and Advocacy Center in Atlanta, which provides services and job training to people who are experiencing homelessness. Sharon is now the Senior Director of Development at Why Hunger, a global nonprofit headquartered in New York City that supports grassroots solutions and invests in sustainable agricultural agriculture worldwide. We'll hear a little bit more about Why Hunger this evening. At Why Hunger, Sharon manages an $8 million annual budget and leads a creative and unorthodox team of partners. Her current focus is on shaping major donors into the kinds of givers who want to fund social transformation rather than charity and cultivating artists and musicians as ambassadors for justice who use their talent and platforms to shift the public narrative and to drive change. She also enjoys shaking up traditional fundraising activities like galas and special events, donor communication and board engagement. Sharon also serves as a board treasurer of the EDGE Funders Alliance, a diverse network of progressive global foundation funders. Maybe we'll hear a little bit more about that work as well. Sharon believes that funders, philanthropists, and donors like all of us have a critical role to play in supporting transformative social change. However complicated our relationship with money may be, Sharon believes that development work is vital to powering the different world that we want to see. Sharon, we're so glad you're here. Welcome back to YDS. Thank you. <laughs> so when we talked about setting up a public conversation, you, you said, let's, let's call it fundraising for social change is an oxymoron. I think I posed it as a question. Oh, is, is fundraising, fundraising for, for social, social change, change an oxymoron? oxymoron? Provocative either way. <laughs> What's that about? Well, I mean, I think sort of simply put, Fundraising is about asking people with money to spare to invest it in causes that really align with their values and the vision that they have for the world. Um, and social change, as opposed to, say, charity, um, you know, charity being you know, giving out meals or helping people get a bed for the night, um, sort of giving people immediate relief but not solving sort of bigger problems, um, social change I see is more getting to the root causes of the social problems that we have. And when you really dig into those root causes, what you understand is that the systems that we have <laughs> that are causing those um, are set up to benefit people um, who've done well. And so asking folks who are doing well in the systems that we have to invest in the kind of change that might make the world different in a way that they might not do as well. Um, that's kind of a, essentially a tough pill to swallow, right? And I think that's part of the challenge, is that the, the traditional ways of raising money and the traditional ways that we talk about raising money and the traditional ways that we engage donors are really set up to fund institutions and practices um, that uphold the kind of systems and institutions that we have now, and not necessarily the ones that are gonna turn the world upside down. We spent some of the afternoon talking about who gives money. Where does the money come from that, that is being used in the nonprofit sector? Can you give us a kind of a, a, an overview of that? Who, who gives money away? Yeah, um, so we talked a lot about this this afternoon. Um, and just to sort of 
kind of break it down very, very quickly. Um, when you actually look at the nonprofit pie, as we said earlier today, about 55% of that actually really comes from earned revenue, right? Nonprofits are making money off of tuition and uh, healthcare. So, you know, the next time you go get a COVID test, you made a charitable donation to a hospital somewhere. Um, and you know, your membership to the Met, right? That's actually charitable giving. It isn't, but that's really powering nonprofits and institutions. Um, and then 30% of that is the government and the final 15% is really foundations and individuals. And that was really the, the core of the conversation that we had earlier today. Um, and individual giving makes up like the biggest part of that. Um, and you know, 30 years ago, most of the individual giving that was happening was really coming from middle and lower income people. People who didn't make a whole lot of money, but who made enough and they wanted to get back to their communities. Um, about 82% of all individual giving came from that community of people, which is actually pretty amazing mm -hmm. that those folks were giving the lion's share of the money that was going to nonprofit work in this country. Um, but, but over the last 20 years, the way that we've seen income inequality just continue to the chasm between the people who have money and the people who don't anymore has gotten so wide that most of that money now comes from a very, very, very small and select group of people whether that is through you know, family foundations or foundation funding or through individuals who are making very large gifts. And the way that that begins to shift and change things is when you have hundreds and thousands and millions of people giving $100 or $1,000, you're spreading that very widely, right? And people are making all kinds of different decisions about the kinds of things that they wanna do and support. But when you've got six people giving um, millions or billions of dollars, then you really only have six people making a decision about the kind of work that's going to be funded. And so right there, you're concentrating an enormous amount of power in the decision making of what happens to that money and how it gets spent. And so we're seeing that um, as those people who are doing well are really choosing to invest in the things that continue to help them do well, while also, of course, wanting to um, support or maybe help people or, you know, fight climate change, but not addressing um, the ways in which that wealth was accumulated that might have actually contributed to or created those problems in the first place. Has the nonprofit world seen a change in the expectations of those givers as the, as the givers are, are fewer and, and wealthier? Expectations how? Uh, strings, the strings that are attached. The, sure. The control over the work that's being done. Yeah, um, we talked a little bit about this earlier too. Um, when, you know, back in the day, right, when people write in their $100, $50 checks or, or whatever, um, you know, maybe they were writing it to their church or their temple or the local library or, you know, the food pantry, um, giving it away, maybe not asking a whole lot of questions. Um, but, but bigger donors and increasingly all donors are really wanting to, to understand what their money is going to, right? They want to see impact, right? And, and especially the more that money is coming from sort of the 1%, if you will, the people who are doing well, who are doing very well, the people who are entrepreneurs, they're business people, um, they're coming with, a, you know, a business mindset, right? They're coming with, a, with an impact investment mindset, right? They want to see what's the ROI on my gift, right? Um, and bringing that, those ideas into the space. And, and that's really tough on a lot of levels. One, because Nonprofits are so underfunded and understaffed um, that those expectations can be pretty crushing. Um, but also, when you're thinking about how long it actually takes to make change, what happens in a year, right? I mean, the systems that we've built, right? Homelessness, hunger, poverty, economic injustice, racism, uh, sexism, all, you know, the things that we're trying to combat and sort of, uh, and and really kind of turn upside down and transform, um, they took centuries to build, right? And so the idea that we're gonna be able to make measurable impact in 12 months um, is, what it really begins to do is, and, and folks said this in class earlier today, um, is it puts the kind of stranglehold on nonprofits to focus on short-term goals, focus on things that they can prove you know, we can show impact on these things, and it keeps them from dreaming big dreams, it keeps them from taking risks, it makes them afraid to fail. 
I want to I want to ask you about your work as a fundraiser and how that takes place. But first, tell us a little bit about why hunger, sure. the context in which you're doing that work. So why hunger? Um, really, the, you know the the point is in the name. Why hunger? So we were founded 50 years ago, really on this question of in a world of abundance, why are people going hungry? Um, and really, it, that was that was an in, that was a sort of um, novel conviction 50 years ago to be saying, what are really the, what are the root causes behind this problem? Like, why are people hungry in the first place? And our work has, has sort of shifted and changed over the years as we've gotten sort of deeper into understanding the root causes of hunger and the answers to those questions. And where we've landed um, after 50 years uh, of engaging people in communities all across the United States and around the world is that the solutions are in communities themselves, right? that people who are most impacted by hunger and poverty truly know what is wrong in their communities. They understand why folks are hungry in their communities, whether it's they don't have access to land or seeds, whether there's no grocery store in their neighborhood and hasn't been for eight years, whether um, folks are don't have the ability to, to grow food or don't have the knowledge or have lost the knowledge, um, lack of you know, nutrition education, it, the reasons are different in different communities. And if you try to try to put a sort of one-size-fits-all, sort of a business model of scale on the problem of hunger, you, you miss the actual details and the dignity in the details of why people are hungry in the first place. And so what Why Hunger does is we really connect with grassroots organizations across the United States and around the globe in 25 countries, um, asking that question of why, and really just listening to what people have to say and trusting, and this is a huge problem, <laughs> most people don't trust folks, low-income folks, folks of color, to actually be the experts of their own experience. And so when you actually listen to what is going on in people's lives, when you listen to what's happening in their communities, and then you say, yeah, let's find you the money, let's get you the resources, let's get you the tools, let's figure out how to get you the land that you need. And we're here with you every step of the way, right? We get you land, you start to build a farm, there's a hurricane, we're gonna be here then too. And just making that commitment year after year after year, um, which is so unusual um, in the funding space, right? Like so often people, maybe they give you a gift and they walk away. Um, but Why Hunger builds these deep and long-term partnerships. Um, and, and then when people say, great, we wanna learn how to do something new, we say, great, we know six other people who are trying that new thing. We're gonna, we're gonna pay to just bring you together so that you can share your, experience and your experiences and your wisdom with one another. And I think it's pretty rare for an organization, you know, headquartered in New York City, we're a global organization, to say, we do not have the answers, but we are delighted to sort of walk alongside and partner with you in order for you all to find your own solutions and share them with one another. And, and that's the kind of scale we need we don't need agriculture scaled across the globe. We need community, um, community to community to community to community building. What we need is little, as, as I said earlier today, it's sort of little points of light all over the world. Um, and, and those folks need to be resourced to do that work. Um, that's how you end hunger. You end hunger by allowing folks to nourish themselves, not by handing them food. Okay, so enormously important work that you obviously care about. <laughs> how do you get the money? Yeah. Isn't that why we're here? How do you get the money? How do you get the money? Well, I will say, it helps when you've been around for 50 years and you've got a big list of names, uh -huh. you know? Um, and it also helps when one of your co-founders was a chart-tapping folk musician. Mm -hmm. um, so Why Hunger has this very hairy shape in, huh. probably... Not, not a, one or two nodding heads in the crowd. Um, you know, Harry Chapin was this really interesting guy. He was a folk musician, but he was on fire about hunger. And he would give every other concert, just give the money away. And he founded Why Hunger um, along with, with Bill Ayers, who was a radio DJ at the time. And they just kind of got started talking about Why Hunger. Um, why is it happening? Um, and so Why Hunger has had a really long history of music being a part of the work that we do. Um, and I think that raises a lot of eyebrows. People are like, music, musicians, fundraising, hunger, how does that work? Um, but I think the, 
So in addition to partnering with musicians, right, so like Bruce Springsteen and Rage Against the Machine and DMC and Tom Morello and Grace Potter and all these people, right, um, who are helping us raise money and awareness, Wyunker also understands that, that music is really part of the sort of soundtrack of social change. Mm. That music and art and the arts have a real role to play in changing hearts and minds and shifting public opinion um, and helping people ask really hard questions. Um, and, and music and the arts can be really subversive. And so in addition to raising money that way, we're also kind of trying to see bigger questions into the public conversation about, about justice rather than charity, about um, solutions rather than, um, than interventions or impact, right? Um, but you know, I think my strategy with fundraising is I am, I'm pretty, well, I'm just gonna say this. I'm pretty bored <laughs> with the standard sort of playbook of this is how you raise money. I mean, even when you read all the literature about like this is how you cultivate a major gift and this is how I see people smiling who've done this work, right? It's like you send out a letter and then you wait two weeks and then you make a call and then after that you make another call and you have to have like a certain number of touch points and it just like isn't how real relationships are built. Um, and and I'm tired of the stories that you have to tell, the way you have to pull people's heartstrings to get the money. It's like, you have to tell these individualistic stories of like tragedy and then success, right? When it's much bigger than that. It's about the system, right? And so if you tell those individual stories of success, then you create these narratives that individual people need to solve their own individual problems, rather than needing to just reframe the question as this is our society that's failed these folks, right? And this one person may have been able to get out, but what about everybody else? And so I'm tired of the emails and the direct mail that, that sort of do poverty porn and, and try to get people to give 100 bucks or 50 bucks or whatever, right? Um, and I'm, I'm tired of the, the relationships that are just about, about essentially creating enough of a relationship in order to get the money um, because that's not really where the transformation happens. And, and when you do this kind of work, you have to bring people along, you have to convert them in a way to a different way of seeing the world and their place in it. And when you have relationships that are transactional, there's no elasticity in that relationship. You can't say, hey, I really need to talk to you about like your power and your privilege. <laughs> and I really need you to give up some of your resources in order to fund a different way of being, right? A different kind of economy. Um, you can't have those conversations with donors that you don't have a relationship with. Um, and so our team is just, is, is really excited about, about sort of asking those bigger questions and about uh, creating and cultivating those deeper relationships and about telling very different stories um, and, and using sort of music and different kinds of events and education and, um, and sort of more creative outlets than just sort of the traditional playbook. Do people want to talk to you? Do they do they go, do they go <laughs> running when you when you approach? Or? You know, generally people go running when fundraising people call, right. right? I mean, that's the thing. Like fundraising gets a really bad rap. Nobody wants to talk to you. Um, there are actually conferences that that fundraising people are banned from. Like if de de development directors in your town, you can't go. Um, you know, and our organization does a lot of sort of um, media work and radio interviews and stuff. Nobody wants to talk to me because they're terrified that I'm gonna like ask them for money, right? Um, you know, but I think, do people want to talk to me? Yes, they do. Because I, and the right people do. And I think that, that's also part of it is sort of finding your people. Because the right people, when you kind of pose those questions, even if they don't know the answers, they're like, huh. Yeah, that doesn't sit right. Let's talk more about that. Um, and I've had a lot of conversations that have been like, huh, this is not the right fit. And you have to move on, mm -hmm. right? And I think there's, there's this real pressure um, in traditional fundraising to like get that gift, get that gift, get that gift at all costs. Um, and there's a lot of freedom in, at Wehunger and in the work that we do to be like, you know what? This is not for you. This is not a good fit. You know, and we're not, gonna, we're not gonna bend it or package it or sell it to you in a way that maybe we can get you to give that gift that first time. Because we know you're not gonna give it again. Because <laughs> we're not gonna lie to you about what we did with it, right? Um, and I think the conversation, we're, 
I will say this, we are not having as many conversations as sort of institutional fundraisers are, right? I'm not, you know, we're not, we don't have 250 major donors on our rolls, that kind of thing. But the conversations that we are having are so much deeper and so much more interesting. Are you comfortable talking with people about money? I love it. Huh. <laughs> Um, I mean, the, the reality is, is that I think anybody who really does fundraising, you know, I and mean, people are like, oh, you just, you just ask people for money all day long. You know, I ask people for money like 14 days a year. You know what I mean? Like when you really, when you really get down to it. Because people are not ATMs. That's not how you treat them, right? You're not just like, give me the money, give me the money, give me the money, give me the money, right? Like, and if you did that, they'd stop talking to you. Um, and <laughs> so what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> And are you comfortable in that space of oh, building yeah. that relationship, yes. and yes. then, but and then and then moving toward the one about money? Yeah. So I think it's important to know. I mean, look, I am a development professional, so I develop relationships with people, right? And they're deep, exciting, awesome, challenging, fun relationships with people. But they still know they're in relationship with a person who works in development at a nonprofit organization. And it is my job and it is my responsibility to ask them for money. If I, you know, if we just kept talking and talking and talking, they'd be like, why are you wasting my time? Like, when are you gonna ask me for money? Um, but I think by the time we get to the place where you're asking for the money, you know, you're so deep in, right? I mean, I've never sat across from somebody and been like, can you give me this money? And they were like, no. I mean, I, I've made other mistakes, maybe emailed somebody, called people and asked them for money when I should have asked them in person, but never face to face have I gotten all the way to the end of this conversation and been like, can you make this gift? And they've said no, right? Um, but I think when you really think about money as, you know, it's actually a real gift to work in nonprofit work. People, I mean, nonprofits really suck sometimes, but the fact of the matter is, is that I get to do what I feel like is really important and meaningful work all the time. A lot of people, especially people who have a lot of money, don't necessarily feel that way about the work that they do. And so the, their resources are in many ways the currency and the, the avenue by which they're expressing their deepest desires for the world, right? It's the thing that they have. And it's sacred in that way that, that when they give this gift, it's because they trust and believe in the work that your organization is doing. And they're entrusting that to you. They're entrusting their the sort of um, yeah, the avenue of their values and their care and their love to you, sort of on their best days. Um, and I like to say that, you know, I get to see people on their best days, right? The day when they decide to be altruistic, when they decide to give up a big chunk of money or even a small chunk of money, um, when they make that decision, like that's the day that I get to hang out with those people. And I'm sure they're not like that all the time. But the days that were there with me, they get to do that and I get to be a part of that. Um, and I think that is kind of a really special and sacred moment. In our conversation this afternoon, we were, we were expressing the, the struggle, the problem, the place of injustice in the yeah. world, the lack, the lack of significant response. Mm -hmm. How do you develop patience in the midst of that while still holding on to a sense of, of the urgency? Yeah. I've learned a lot from our grassroots partners in this way, right? People who are doing this work, folks who are on the ground, who are on the front lines. There's an incredible amount of urgency for folks whose literal lives are on the line, right? Like if they can't get, if they can't get land or seeds or food or whatever, like they are in crisis, right? If they can't push back upon, you know, governments that are coming for them, they are in crisis. Um, you know, I was just in Colombia over the summer visiting a partner. Um, you know, who've been essentially like hunted down by paramilitary groups. Like these people's lives are on the line. Like there is no more urgency than that. And yet, they know that they have to go together, which means that they have to go slow sometimes. And even though there's an, there's an incredible amount of urgency in that work, they know that they need to take time, they need to make decisions together. And it's been really amazing when you come from I like to say that, that fundraising is sort of the bridge between the world as it is and the world as it should be. And so you end up being kind of this like cord between these two things. And there's a real tension in the kind of the money world, right, of urgency. Like donors are like, they expect this now. You tell them that you're gonna get a proposal. They wanna see it, they want that email, they wanna know, they wanna go on the trip, they wanna see the impact, right? And then you've got these organizations who are, who are going slow, who are going together, 
who are doing that kind of change and trying to kind of manage those two things. Um, and I think the thing that gives me the patience to do this work and to sort of see the sort of long term is really the profound hope that I feel when you actually see communities doing this work, right? When you hop on, a, on the A train out to the Far Rockaways and you see that there's a three acre farm that is run entirely by youth of color who are getting paid good money to grow food and harvest that food and they've set up a market and they're selling it at low or almost no cost in a community that has no grocery stores and no access to fresh food, right? And then those folks are going on to like go to college and get degrees and then come back and then run the organization and um, run for office, right? I mean, just the way, it's not just about the food, right? The food is the gathering place, it's the community place, it's the skill building place, it's the sort of nourishment place that, um, that creates real like hope um, and skills uh, that launch people into sort of different places. And so I think seeing that happen and seeing that happen in India and in Minnesota and in Mexico, you understand that, um, that the solutions are already here, right? Like that world that we quote wanna see, it's already here, it's already happening. And the question is just how can we continue to invest in that? How can we build that? How can we grow that? Um, and that's the thing that gives me hope is that it's already happening. We, we had really rich conversation this afternoon, and in a minute I'm going to turn to you and ask for your question. Um, but as you prepare that question, let me ask about fundraising with regular folks. So it, 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 it can sound like this is work with, with only those of yeah. great means. Um, what, what, what's, the role of, what's the role of those people who you said 20 years ago mm. and longer yeah. carried the nonprofits with their smaller gifts? Is there still a place for them? For us? Absolutely. Um, and I think, yes. And, and I think increasingly, um, a lot of smaller nonprofits and grassroots nonprofits are really looking to donors like that because they, they either can't or don't want to work with foundations or people of wealth. They don't have the time or even the inclination um, to work with folks and try to sort of bring them along on this journey. They're like, look, if you don't, if you don't get this, like, we don't have time for it, we're moving on. Um, and I think there's, there's a real role for, I mean, we saw this with Black Lives Matter, with Bernie Sanders, I mean, folks who are out raising millionaires and billionaire donors, right, with 50 bucks, five bucks, 100 bucks, $2, you know, monthly donations. Um, and I think if we, if we allow ourselves to say, oh, the billionaires are, you know, controlling all the money, it's, it, it's a, um, it allows us to excuse ourselves from the role that we could play. Um, that, you know, if t 20 years ago, 82% of that money was coming from people like us. Um, if people can give five bucks, give 15 bucks, give 100 bucks, right? I mean, and this is the question is for folks who are doing maybe not well, but okay, are we all investing? in the organizations that we think have the solutions and are doing the right work? Are we, are we giving at the level we can to help these organizations envision and do the work that they need to do? Um, and I mean, it's not just about money, right? Like most nonprofits run on volunteers. Like billions and billions of dollars of time are donated. And I'm always putting in a plug for, you know, everybody wants to like volunteer with like programs and do the thing and like do the work, but like go volunteer for your local nonprofit development team. Those folks are burnt out, right? I mean, and the number of donors that, that are like, my thank you letter was late, right? Or there was a typo in it or whatever. It's like, if all of those people said, you know what? This actually annoyed me that my thank you letter was Im Im imperfect. Just went and said, hi. I'm here, I'd love to copy edit your thank you letters, and then I'll print them and fold them and stamp them and mail them so that no one else has this experience. Instead of saying, I'm not going to give you my $25 donation anymore, say, I'm gonna be a part of the solution, right? And I think 
people expect so much from nonprofits, right? They're like, change the world and also like do the letters and do the emails and get everything right and never make mistakes and you know, don't fail, right? It's like we have to be everything to every no one expects businesses not to mess up. They're like, we're gonna pay you billions of dollars to make huge mistakes and have the government bail you out and whatever and, <laughs> and destroy the planet and it's fine, right? And then we'll give you awards and put you on boards. But if you're a nonprofit, they're like, please be both completely morally amazing and perfect, really good at your job, have zero resources, and then like honor what I give you as well perfectly, right? And so <laughs> there's just this like totally ridiculous system um, in which we've created a completely starved sector that's supposed to be able to tackle huge social problems created by companies that we don't hold accountable. Um, so like, I don't know. Go give some time. Say, I'm gonna make 300 donor calls for you over the next three months. I'm just gonna call people and thank them. I love your work. I'm the best person to talk about how much I should be grateful for you for giving to this organization that I love. Um, so I think it's important to remember that it's not just about, it's not just about money. Um, and also, as we were talking about in class earlier, right? Like, demonstrate, show up, put your body where people need you to be. Um, we have a, you know, we have a much bigger role to play in social change. <laughs> Call your legislator, <laughs> ask them to raise corporate taxes, whatever. I mean, I think we all have, um, we all have more work to do. Um, and I think it can, it can get easy to fall, uh, fall asleep at the wheel when it feels like the system is rigged, right? It's hopeless, so forget it. Mm. And uh, we can't do that. Who has a question? I think we have a mic to share. <laughs> Hi. Um, earlier, well, you were just saying that you're tired of the usual playbook. <laughs> and earlier in class, folks were kind of bringing up, you know, different practices, more community-based practices, mm -hmm. like mutual aid or mm -hmm. um, maybe giving circles mm -hmm. or things like that. Can you um, talk a little bit about, either from the development side or from the gift-giving side, a practice that you're really excited about? What am I really excited about right now? Well, I have to be honest, it's November, which means it's end of year giving season. So <laughs> there's not a lot I'm excited about, no. Um, I'm excited about young people, and I'm really excited about, about art. Um, I'm really excited about, um, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about uh, is, um, is creating like an artist in residence program at Why Hunger, like the Harry Chapin Artist in, in Residence program, um, and and thinking about creating space for movement artists. So not just like famous people, but people who are creating art or creating music um, in uh, in the movement to be able to like do that work. Um, and I don't know, thinking about like social media and thinking about about really because I think. Changing this narrative about um, about social problems is really important, and I think that when we um, when we think about raising money or raising awareness, um, I like I'm not I'm not a social media person. I think I'm very excited about it, but I but I'm really excited about how um, like the way teenagers are like making videos and creating poetry and art and music, um, and and really creating a different generation of people who understand these problems very differently um, and who understand their role in, in giving, in showing up, um, and in, the, in, in that like, maybe social change really isn't just about nonprofits doing this work, um, that it's bigger than that. It's actually a perfect segue because you just mentioned the young people. And <laughs> I'm, no, but I'm curious because I think um, we talked in class earlier about the diminishing sort of regular person yeah. gift. But yeah. I'm from the Bay Area, which is a place where like a lot of nonprofits have failed because there doesn't seem to be quite, sorry, huh. like old nonprofits have sort of died. Yeah. Um, because there doesn't seem to be quite the culture of philanthropy yeah. like amongst millennials yeah. and, and maybe Gen Z. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious to know like what you're thinking about um, yeah. with regard to sort of a cultivating a new donor. Yeah, it's it's it is interesting because I think um, a lot of nonprofits are experiencing this, right? Their their donors are older, the 
people who give significantly or older, um, and that sort of culture of philanthropy. And and there's been this kind of wave of um, like do good businesses that I think are have really tried to corner the market on like buy jeans that are like also good for the world, right? And that like I I feel like the younger people want to put their money potentially where it's sort of marketing, like my makeup gives back, my jeans give back, my, you know, and, and there's a way in which your like virtuous business or whatever is better than the alternative, but it's still this sort of like consumerist idea of like buying stuff that's also just quote unquote doing good. Um, I think it's hard, um, as we know, young people are, making so much less money than the, than the generations before them. You know, I mean, we're, aren't, we're responsible for everything. We're not buying cars, we're not buying houses, we're not buying diamond rings, we're not getting married, whatever. Um, so I think we're, <laughs> we're breaking all of the norms. Um, but I've seen young people understand the power of organizing in a very different way. Um, and I think people put their money where their values are. And that's where I think, and this probably answers your question a little bit better, um, where communities are basically saying, like, we're gonna create things. We're gonna make publications or sell t-shirts or you know, um, have membership dues, right? Where people just have to put their own money, even if it's 20 bucks or 50 bucks or whatever, um, to power the work that they wanna see. Um, and I think that, what's been missing like in the 80s and the 90s and 2000s is really that kind of like mass organizing. Um, and we're seeing that I think more and more. Um, and certainly I think as sort of the gap between the US and the rest of the world continues to close, um, I think there's sort of a rising awareness in the United States that other countries have major movements, right, of people um, who are building power to demand change and our country does not have, you know, we have the civil rights movement, certainly the LGBTQ movement, um, but I think we have a lot to learn from the sort of structured, organized social movements of other countries. Um, and I think young people are, are going to get that and have, are already getting that in ways that, um, that older folks maybe don't. Hi, I'm um, wondering if you could speak a little bit about your divinity school background and how hmm. YDS may or may not inform what you do now, or you know, how does theology, yes or no, I was just talking to Bill about this earlier today. Um, yeah. So I came here wanting to study like ancient languages uh, and then I met Allison and was working at Columbus House. I highly recommend internship programs um, because sort of getting out into the world outside of the ivory tower is very important to informing sort of your sense of what is happening in the world. Uh, it can be easy sort of in this bubble to forget. Um, and I kind of had this moment where I was like, yo, people are dying. Like, what am I doing reading these tiny Greek letters? And what does it all mean? <laughs> um, you know, and then got, got excited about and interested in the ways that, you know, justice work was being talked about 12, 14 years ago here. Um, felt new and exciting, uh, maybe. And, and the way that, that religion at the time, the way that I was thinking about it was that that faith and the church has sort of a claim on your life, right? Like your values and your worldview and your, your belief system, which is where the sort of locus of transformation is. And then um, kind of got out of this, um, and at the time, I mean, Mark Juan Chapel was in, you know, incredible, really testing sort of new ways of worship that were exciting and creative, but also really bringing justice to the center and kind of drawing um, in inspiration from other places. And, um, and it was exciting to think about what was possible, right? Somebody mentioned um, in class the 
St. Lydia's Dinner Church, right, and that, that we could be thinking about and organizing ourselves around sort of a different table. Um, and then I went out into the world and realized that mostly churches are not having those conversations. <laughs> um, and I think that there's a real, the church is a hard place right now. It's hard, it's hard to feel like the institutions that people love are um, dying. And I really believe that the things that would reinvigorate those places, like getting deeply, deeply engaged in sort of transformative ways of engaging folks who are living in poverty or people who are different and really making that not the most segregated hour in America. Um, so folks are so concerned about like actually continuing the institution and the building and the things, right? Um, that they can't really agree on the things that might actually blow the doors open and bring new people in. Um, and I think I got really tired of kind of hoping that the church would be the locus of social change, at least for me. Um, and, but I will say that whether I'm not even, <laughs> I'm not even sure <laughs> whether I'm agnostic or what anymore, but it feels less and less important the answer to that question. And for, but for me, the kind of framework that the values of, of um, the sort of the last will be first, that the, you know, like that, that, that sort of worldly power and money is sort of just not the thing. Um, those values that are really not um, of this world, that like, that humility, that um, gen enormous generosity, I mean, that those values and the values of justice that I learned here whether or not there's some supreme being <laughs> responsible for that, like that is the framework that drives the work that I do and it informs my worldview. Um, and so I don't, it's hard to separate the worldview and the, and the sort of like innate um, way that I see uh, a different future that's very rooted in that, that is yet sort of no longer connected to the community um, where that ideology kind of came from. And I think it's one of the things that I struggle with a lot. Um, because I think doing theology in community is actually how, you know, <laughs> how you sort of shift and change things. Um, and I'm not really connected to that community anymore. I'm curious about the people who do this work with you. So both in your own, mm -hmm. in your own agency and more broadly. What do you see going on among people who are who are asking these questions and working in the world of development, uh, why are they doing it? And what matters in that world? You know, it really runs the gamut. I think the people that I like most who are doing development work <laughs> um, are the people who are doing it. I mean, I don't know anybody who was like, I want to be a fundraiser when I grow up, right? Like, um, most of the people that I know do it because they can't not. Because they can't not. Because they, they must, either because their community needs them to, um, because they are on fire for something and they know that they need money to do it, um, because they see a problem or they see and, and they, need to, they need to do everything they can to fix it. Um, or because they have figured out how to kind of walk in both worlds, right? Um, how to kind of switch between the kind of the world of money and the world of movements or the world of change. Um, and I think there's something really kind of powerful about accepting the mantle of work that is hard and that is often maligned um, that a lot of people don't want to do because it's awkward or it's uncomfortable or it's taboo um, or just because it's just takes an enormous amount of time. Um, accepting that mantle, especially on behalf of your community, um, I think is really powerful. Um, I think from a pragmatic perspective, it's just also where most nonprofits are always hiring. Right, and that's, that's an important reason to ask the question too. Yeah. I think we're aware on the Divinity School campus that there, for people wanting to work in the nonprofit sector, the first jobs, or at least a bunch of jobs, are going to be available in development. Mm -hmm. um, who, 
So what kind of people do you hire? <laughs> Let's just say in this room there were somebody looking for a job. <laughs> um, I almost never I know hire. That's a stretch. <laughs> I almost never hire anyone with any development experience, um, huh. ever. Mostly because I think that when you've learned certain processes and practices, it can be kind of hard to unlearn them. Um, and because I think the most the most important thing that you need is sort of a real passion for the cause and a real affection for people. And then it's like, whatever, everything else from there you can learn. So, you know, I hired a black farmer to run our event. And I hired a yoga teacher and creative to be our sort of social engagement and impact person. Uh, I hired an MFA creative writer to do all of our sort of grant proposals and, and sort of donor you notes, writing. Right? <laughs> she writes the best freaking thank you notes. Um, but you know, but people who just are on fire, who just, who love this work and who want to think about it in exciting and different and new ways. Um, and who don't, you know, I had one of my really good friends got a job at the New York City Botanical Gardens right out of college, and I remember her telling me that she spent an entire afternoon one, one day looking at the margins, like not even the actual words on the thank you note page, but the margins, like are they all the same? And I thought, oh my God, you know? Like I just can't even imagine caring about that or hiring somebody who cared about that. And so, and so I think, you know, folks who are just like, how can we, how can we start using like video and how can we start using like audio and how can we stop just like worshiping the written word and like break out of this and start engaging people in new and exciting ways and you know how can we have events where people are having experiences of the, of the work rather than like sitting around eating chicken and listening to people talk. Um, and so, <laughs> so if you want different strategies, you have to hire people with different perspectives. Um, and so, you know, I'm a real advocate for like, hire a rowdy band of people who want to get stuff done. <laughs> Managing it is really hard. <laughs> um, but it's exciting and it's good. So how'd you know, oh, sorry, Avery, yeah. Yeah, my question is kind of around what you're just talking about. I'm curious how we recommend balancing um, getting new ideas, mm. innovative, thinkers, yeah. people with varied backgrounds. Um, yeah. How do you balance that with like making sure people are still um, have the, I don't even know what you call it, the literacy to talk to those who have the most money. Um, so like Villanueva talks about like the aspect of like white culture that yeah. like, permeates yep. things. Like how do you make yeah. sure those folks, that artist, that dancer yeah, yeah. can still talk to yeah. the bankers? Totally. So one of the things that we've been doing a lot at White Hunger is um, really democratizing access to information and particularly the budget. So like the budget is, you know, knowledge of the budget is power. And when people don't understand concepts, they usually just stay quiet, which means they don't tell you what they think, which means you don't know what they think, which means you don't know what their ideas are. Because if you're sitting around a budget meeting talking about deficits and and you know P&Ls and cash flow statements and you know a cash reserve versus an operating reserve versus a line of credit. If people don't know what those words mean, they're just going to be quiet, right? And and so what we've done is um, invited everyone to our monthly budget meetings and just spent a lot of time explaining, educating. Um, in our in our team meetings, the development team, we just we talk about we talk about money all the time. We talk about the budget, and every monthly meeting with the entire staff, I go through the revenue line by line, and I get real vulnerable about it. I'm like, you know what? I had this conversation with this donor. I'm not sure this is coming in. I feel nervous about this. I need a new strategy, and it's been amazing to hear you know folks who work in programs, folks who work in you know admin or communications have an idea, have a thought want to help, want to partner, right? And, and so really destigmatizing the conversation about money. Um, and I've, I've talked to and led conversations with the whole staff, with the program staff, with the development staff about money. 
Because a lot of the folks who work at White Hunger are BIPOC folks, right? And money can be, I mean, for anyone, but especially for communities who've been denied access to it historically, um, it can be deeply emotional and really tough. And so actually having those conversations and giving the space for people to say, like, filling out my credit card report fills me with fear and dread. Like, I know I'm allowed to spend this money, but I get freaked out because I'm afraid someone's going to tell me that I did something wrong or that I messed it up or I don't know how to do it. And so really just, like, making this space for people to just ask questions mm -hmm. all the time and really, and really, like, liberating people to, like, you know, nobody doesn't have access to the admin drive and the files and every version of the budget and every version of the, of the cash flow, right? Everybody knows and everyone has access to that information. And it's, it's powerful the way that's changed. It's not just about ideas about money. It's changed the way we relate to each other as an organization. So classically, development and programs are just like, we live here, you live there, lots of bad blood, lots of distrust. Y'all want us to sell our work one way. You don't want us to help us and raise money, blah, 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 right? You can't do your work like that. And, and I think getting everyone comfortable with the language of money is one of the most powerful things you can do. So if you were sitting in front of a group of divinity students who were thinking about their own, their own relationship to money and their work in development for justice, what would you tell them to do during divinity school? Let, let's even take the, the internship <laughs> off the table. What would, you, what would you say they should study? What should they study? One another. I mean, you are each other's best resources um, because this work is just really about getting curious and building relationships, and it's about listening to actually understand people and to hear what they're afraid of and what they're excited about and what they love and not to listen to it to exploit it, to say, how can I craft the perfect gift so that you will want to give it because now I know all this about you, but to say, like, how can we come into real partnership? And whether or not that's around a shared goal of making some sort of work or pro program happen, or whether that's around a conversation that getting comfortable talking to people and coming to know them in a deep way, um, I think is sort of critical for everything that we're trying to do. Um, and that the, that the skills that you need to do this work, um, you're not going to learn them in any book, right? Um, and, then, and the other thing that you need to do beyond building relationships with people and learning how to do that and get comfortable with that is you just have to get on fire for something. Mm -hmm. And if you're not on fire for something, then you gotta figure out how to get on fire for something. And the way that you're gonna do that is talking to other people who are lit up. So, you know, look around. Who are you like, damn, that person is just lit up. I wanna talk to them about what they do. Will you join me in thanking Sharon Gamaliel for being with us? <laughs>